Tag the Year, Vuggis Falcher. Hi, hello. It's me, John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School again. And we are rolling on with our 90 day challenge here at the IPS, um, where we're trying to turn up on YouTube every single day, you know, split between myself and my partner, Laura O'Brien, to provide some resource, some content, some inside looks, some background perspectives or backstories and origins. Um, it's just a personal challenge. <laughs> um, one of the big things for me as a content creator is creating content um, it's important to kind of make sure that uh, we are turning up for our community and for our work on a daily basis and given that we work from home this is the office environment and um, the discipline for that can be quite challenging and so this is one thing that I have never really been comfortable with this you know doing the video as much as I'm getting loads of comments thank you very much for all of the comments on YouTube about my ability to weave a good story and kind of engages and connects us all in I still get very self-conscious about it. So Gaurav Mahagas, thank you very much for all the comments in our YouTube. Um, I do read them, uh, pretty much all of them I scroll through. And anyway, different point, back on track. <clears throat> yeah, so we're turning over, uh, our, our kind of challenging ourselves with this content push, if that makes sense. Um, I will always almost gravitate to writing in the background or designing t-shirts in a lot or kind of like running the classes for the Irish Pagan School, which I am doing at the end of this month. At the end of the month over in the Irish Pagan School on Teachable, I'm teaching a class on making an offering or making offerings in general. And this is one of the kind of cornerstone practices in a pagan faith and this kind of relationship that we have, this core quiveness, this right relationship that we have with deity usually involves some form of offering. And so I'm teaching class at the end of the month on that. And it's something I have always kind of done, but it's important to know why we do these things. You know, why is it, um, why it behooves us to make sure we're having that relationship where we're giving as much as receiving from our deities. And this is then the idea of offerings. And we do get questions on a regular basis asking like, you know, well, how do I make an offering? What kind of offering works? Like, I want to make an offering to this God, that deity. How do I do it? What, what makes it work? And hopefully I'll be answering a lot of those questions in the class. But there was one thing I wanted to dive in and share with you now is my relationship specifically with the Dagda and how I make offerings with him. Now, I touched on a previous video when I talked about how I met the Dagda and my kind of contractual obligation, my offering that I made is that I will say his name aloud every day. So Dagda, 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 <laughs> the Dagda. And that is, it's part of me sending that intentional energy and awareness out into the world, which I'm very grateful that many of you um, have heard about the Dagda for the first time through me. Again, I mentioned how humbled I am by that, but also a little bit sad that more people aren't aware of how awesome and great this God is. Um, but you can watch the other video if you want to touch on that. But this idea then of offerings um, and my offerings with him. So my main chief offering is to raise awareness of him, to kind of tell the stories, to kind of connect people with my understanding and my perspectives of this deity. And that is the kind of the core element of it. But that's not the only thing I do. There's another kind of routine of offering that I do and on the daily, which is first cream. And so whenever um, I open a fresh or new cream in this household for cream within my coffee, because I'm a cream in my coffee kind of guy, and um, the first person I pour cream for is him, which is usually in his coffee. <laughs> so we have a habit now of um, having our coffees together. And so it goes over here. You can see behind me, there's the, the, the cauldron. And beside that is a mug handle. And that is the first cream on his coffee. And um, people ask me as well, how does the dag to take his coffee? To be honest, it, it's almost may, maybe an Irish cultural thing as well. If someone, if you offer someone something, they say, I, I'll have what you're having. You know, it's that kind of idea of, I don't want to be a bother. Whatever you're having is good enough for me. And I get that approach from him. So the way I take my coffee is two spoons of coffee and um, maple syrup and a bit of cream, splash of cream, hot water. So mixed Mixed with a bit of intention. you got to set your intention right while you're stirring it. Um, and so uh, I'll be talking more about that. But it, it got me thinking again. And I was chatting with Laura about it. And Laura was like, well, obviously, first cream comes from the, the history, from the lore. And I was like, I don't know if I've read that story. 
And so she put it, the question in my bard brain, which I've talked about questions before. I love a good question because it then gives me the opportunity to do the exploration, to do the research, to dive in and try and find the information I'm looking for. And um, it turns out I had re read the story before, but I didn't remember the name of it. And so the name of the particular story we're looking at is um, in Gobelin C, which is the terrible pronunciation, but it, it's the taking of the she. And this is found in the Book of Leinster and the Book of Vermoy. Now, one of my personal favorite translators of this content is Morgan Dimberg. They are a legend. You can follow them over at Living Liminally on their blog, uh, where I kind of found the version of the story that I like to go to because it follows the ancient bard tradition. If you've seen the video being a bard, it's worth kind of being aware of that. But it's this kind of cached or question where a bard is put to the question and they better have the right answer. And that's how you kind of judge your, your skill as a bard. So the cached was placed upon an, a bard and then the bard would like, oh, not hard to say, the answer was how all that kind of stuff would start. And so this section of the story follows that like cultural kind of habit of cached and question and answer, the cached and the answer. Um, and it's not hard to say. So that's why I really love it. And because it's such a well-defined part of the habits of performance and storytelling and the culture and narrative of bars in ancient Irish society, the fact that though these texts were written in the 11th century, jotted down by monks, we know that this history, this kind of format of storytelling is so much older than that. Um, so I absolutely love it. Again, you know, living liminally is where you'll find it. And it's the taking of the she is the story. So essentially I won't read the entire thing for you but i will give you the, the the top end summary this is kind of set at the end of the age of mythology where the mythological cycle where the the two of Danon have reigned in ireland and the, the, there's actually three kings in ireland at this point which are the three sons of kermit and minibal which is the son of the dagda yes that is the kermit who was killed by lou for his indiscretion with lou's wife and who the dagda went and then took up the power took up the responsibility of life and death in order to bring back his child if you want that story in full, I'll tell it a different time. I have a, an interesting thoughts and perspectives about, about the club, whether or not the club even exists. So, yeah. Um, but we have these kind of descendants of the Dagda. So the Dagda is king in Ireland for 80 years. Then we have these grandsons, or the three kings in Ireland, at the end of this mythological cycle when the Milesians arrive, the sons of Mill. And so the Milesians come from across Europe and Spain, and they are the the latter form of arrivals, because the, all of this comes from a series of stories known as Laura Gabala Air, the Book of the Taking of Ireland. And it's the Book of Invasions in one translation, but it's this taking of Ireland. And it speaks about the core origin story of our island is actually immigration and emigration, which is one thing I love. And I, I felt the pressures of emigration in my time growing up and, you know, oh, well, maybe there's no work here in Ireland, you better feck off and go to Australia. My brother-in-laws you know, went over there. One of them has come home. Another one is over in Australia still, because that was that was how you did it. Like you, you emigrated out of Ireland and then you sent money home to look after your family in Ireland. And there is all of that cultural kind of spread, which is very important to us. And that's what leads to the diaspora. That's why there's so many people of Irish descent all over the world. Um, but they all still have this, this longing, this connection, this grow or love for Ireland. Back on track, John. Um, so yes, this story, the cycle of emigration and immigration, even the two of the Dan coming in are descendants of emigrants returning into Ireland. You know, descend, they are, in, wait, let me get it right. They, yes, they are descended of emigrants who went out and they are immigrating back into Ireland. Um, and so this is one thing I absolutely love about our narrative. And just to, to step sideways, anyone who tries to bar entry to new people coming into Ireland or to new tribes arriving into Ireland, even nowadays, is not really keeping the, the true nature, true culture and true connection of our landscape. Ireland has always welcomed new people in and always found a way to integrate and to become part of a greater, more you know, beautiful whole as we share and grow together. Those are my personal thoughts on that. But anyway, back to the point. Yeah, we were talking about the, the taking of the sheep. So in the this end of the age of mythology, right? The Milesians arrive in, they come out of Spain. And first, actually, there, there's one guy who's on a tower 
on the coast of Spain. His name was Id. And he's looking out across. And on a clear day, it, it was the most clear, most beautiful, sunshiny day. He sees something that he has never seen before. And it's a landmass. It's a new land. And it's out across the sea where there was no thought that there was land. And so he gets curious and he's like, OK, let's get in a boat and let's go find it. And so as he kind of sails out, um, like the clouds come in, the mists come down and he has a hard time finding it. But eventually he lands in Ireland and that's where he meets these three grandsons of the Dagda and, you know, goes to their courts. And he's speaking very much about his tribe and their conquests as they have conquered most of Europe and, you know, the the three kings are like, yeah, great. Yeah, thanks. Oh, great to have you here. Fantastic. And then as he's leaving, he's like, yeah, well, I'll leave and go back home. It's great. And I'm going to tell everyone how beautiful your land is, how abundant your land is. It's so green. Like there's all of this kind of fantastic stuff here. And as he's preparing to leave, the three lads are like, if he goes back, we're doomed. <laughs> um, so they kill him. They have him killed. Um, but then the guilt kicks in because part of their tradition, part of their narrative is to make sure that um, people are interred properly. You know, that's why we have so many mounds, so many hills, so many kind of barrows all around Ireland. It's because there was this culture of respect for the dead, this respect for internment. And so they take his body, they preserve his body, put it back in the boat and they send him back home. But again, his body arrives back in Spain in his boat. And the rest of his brothers, these other sons of male, are like, well, how the hell did he die? Where the hell did that come from? And it starts this whole question and query, and then they find out that there is another land out there. And that starts the conquest of the sons of male. And so they come to Ireland not to integrate, not to kind of arrive, but they come to conquer. And so there's a long kind of story around that. And it does lead to the conquest of the Sons of the Mill over the two of the Dan. And I can cover that in a different time if you're interested in knowing that narrative. Actually, the name of Ireland, the Irish name Era, actually comes from Eru. Eru was one of the three sovereignty goddesses in Ireland, married to one of the three kings in Ireland. And that's why Ireland, Ireland now, today, is still named Erin or Era in honor of that goddess. So when I talk about how real this mythology is to us, how kind of present it totally is on our landscape, I'm not bluffing you. The name, the literal name of our Ireland, island is still named for a goddess. So it's important, it's very fucking important to us. Um, so this, what happens then is this conflict between the Milesians and the two of the Danon. There is then this... Yeah, it, it doesn't end favorably, but it turns out that the conquest is, 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 is yeah, it goes in the sense of mill. They kind of, they do most of the things right. They kind of connect with the goddesses of sovereignty. They they have feet of arms. They have feet of magics. They can overcome. In fact, one of the, the leaders of this invasion is actually a fella. It's a bard. And his name is Amergan, Amergan Glungal or White Knee. <laughs> and it's it's his naming of things. It's his power with names and words that allows them to come into Ireland and to kind of succeed. And uh, so when the conquest ends, there is then the resolution because it's not a war of annihilation. It's it's close to, but it's not kind of completely genocide. Um, so Amergan kind of arranges that what we'll do is we'll split the island We'll take the top half and the two of the Dana can have the bottom half. And that was the agreement. But when everything was agreed and signed, Armageddon was like, yep, well, the wording that we used was the top half, which is everything on top. Everything below or under the bottom is the two of the Danon. And so that's where the two of the Danon need to go into the she or the hollow hills. And they become the Dini she, the people or the A she, the people of the hollow hills. Um, and that's where we find our gods and goddesses now as they have transitioned and moved into that other world life um, where they're led in by monodon. So the story, this taking of the she is that particular tale. But it doesn't end well for the Milesians because everything that grows in Ireland grows from below. All of the nutrients are taken up from the earth, which then become the wheat, which become like the, the grass, which become the trees, which become the fruit, which then the kind, the, the cattle feed on, and then they give out their milk. And so with this kind of shift in things, the two of them were like, well, we'll keep what's ours by contract, by agreement. We're not doing nothing wrong here. Um, and Ireland becomes a wasteland. And so it's this very real impact of 
not making right with the other world, not being right with, in right balance, in that core quiveness, that right relationship with the powers of the other world. And so Ireland becomes a wasteland, the cattle won't give any milk, the, the wheat won't or grains won't actually grow. And then the Milesians kind of realize you've done fucked up, chief. And so they go to their, their, their solution guy. They go to the one guy who has enough words and enough power with words to forge uh, some form of resolution to this, and that's Amergan again. So Amergan is sent to the two of the Dan, and he's sent to the Shi, the people of the Shi, and he's like, you know, how do we fix this? And the two of the Dan are like, well, we did nothing wrong. We're honoring the agreement that you set in place. You said that everything below belongs to us, so we're just keeping what belongs to us. And Amergan realizes that, you know, this kind of literal translation of the words he he played the literal translation with like to force them into the ground but they're just abiding by that by keeping what's in the ground themselves <laughs> and so he's like okay well we need to kind of change we need to kind of revisit we need to renegotiate this agreement in order to find a true balance um and i actually wrote a story about that um because the person that they have to make the balance with is the Dagda. It actually says in the language that they need to become friends of the Dagda, uh, Korja La Dagda. So uh, yeah, they have to go to the Dagda and they have to make it right. <laughs> so even though we have him ruled for 80 years and in one version of the lower mythology, the Dagda actually dies from wounds taken during the second battle of Maitura, we still then have, after his grandkids, after moving into the Shi, into the other world, he's still this very important figure. He's still this kind of pretty big fucking deal. So the Milesians can't have an abundant landscape without making right by him, without kind of being friends or being on side with one of the leading powers in the other world. And so they come to an agreement that there will be offerings so that nothing would be grown or harvested in Ireland without an offering being left for the other, for the Dini Ma, for the Dini Shi or the Ea Shi. Um, and so it's it's so crucially important to the abundance and the wealth and the continued kind of growth of Ireland to maintain that right relation, to maintain that. And that's where the, the process of Halloween comes from. You know, Halloween is actually Samhain and it's that end of the year when all the harvests come in. And so offerings were always laid out for the other crowd on Halloween. It wasn't just, you know, kids in, in masks going around getting treats. It was actually completing that contract that agreement that would ensure the next year by giving and sharing of your abundance with the other crowd with the dinima the other the she and by the way dinima is the irish word for good folk and um, it's a nice way of saying the other crowd and um, there are many different talks we actually have a fantastic class on fairy face done by the amazing morgan daimler in the irish pagan school and um, they are absolutely brilliant and i would definitely recommend experiencing their classes which is why we refer to them as the good neighbors or the good people because you don't want to accidentally insult them and then bring ruin upon yourself and um, so anyway back to this idea of offerings people kind of wonder where this whole thing of offerings come from why offerings are important and it is very clearly stated and very clear in our origins of ireland that offerings to the deities offerings to our gods are about keeping that relationship going keeping that honor and that respect going so in a way i'm following the lineage and following the contract and maintaining the contract set down by the earliest descendants of humanity who came into the island, the Milesians. Um, and that to me is fascinating. That to me is awesome and amazing. And that to me, um, as much as it's not something I feel like, oh, but it's something I want to share, even though, you know, it is that level of awareness and that right kind of balance in the relationship. And so when we talk about offerings, we need to talk about something that we feel a sharing of or we feel a giving of um, that kind of honors the agreements, honors the respect and honors the connection that we share with our deities and with our, our guides and our guardians. Um, so that is why first cream in this household will always be poured for the data. And, you know, he invariably takes it in his coffee with me. <laughs> So I like my coffee, strong, dark, like I like my deity, <laughs> large, powerful, strong, and helps me do everything. Um, so 
hopefully that's a bit of an insight hopefully that's a bit of a, an intriguing kind of story about why we make offerings um as i said i'll be teaching a class on that at the end of the month if you're interested in there you need to go over to the irish pagan school make sure you've signed up um and you can take the class you can join in the live kind of teaching get to ask me a couple of questions put me to the question like a, a good bard is put to the question on the teachings um or if you can't make it to live you can catch the recordings after the fact so Speaking of questions, if you have any more questions, any comments on this, do please make sure you add them to the, the track there below. And if you want to have your question answered or you want to not miss, if I do answer your question, do hit the like and the subscribe button. It helps with the narrative. It helps with the, the algorithms. Make sure you hit that bell for notifications so that you do get notified whenever, you know, you're going to see a John face pop up on the YouTubes. Um, so again, thank you very, very much. Gaurav Mila Mahagas um, for all of your amazing comments, for all of your amazing connection. And from all of us here at the Irish Pagan School, look after yourself. Remember, you are a unique expression of humanity in this entire existence. There will be no one who can be you as you were. So love yourself, respect yourself, and look after yourself. Till next time, Salon. Goodbye.